hypothesis testing part two. Okay, so we talked about the five steps. Uh, if you recall, you can scroll up so we can read them off again real quick. Um, the first one is we develop our hypotheses. That includes our null and our, our alternative. Then we choose a level of significance, which is the level of disbelief or the level of unlikelihood sufficient to warrant disbelief. All right, you gotta be careful about that. And then we choose our appropriate test statistic. For now, that'll be easy. That will get more complicated as we look at more tests. Uh, then we collect our data. We compute the test statistic. And then last but not least, we evaluate the test statistic. All these steps are pretty easy. Break it down into these five steps. Do them over and over again, we'll be fine. Um, but we're gonna start with step one. Uh, step one is, it is, let me get my pen, it is developing our hypotheses. So how do we do that? Okay, let's uh, move over here. So, developing hypotheses. How do we do that? Well, we do it very carefully. And it does take this part, as we get more into this, this, this is one of the hardest parts, for sure. Um, that's not to say that we can't do it well. We can. It just takes a little bit of practice, and you start to get the hang of it after a little while. So, we have two types of hypotheses. Um, one is the null, which is our maintained belief. And it's what we give the benefit of the doubt. In the absence of evidence to the contrary, it's the one we're going to act under, right? the belief that will prevail. So it's the one we're assuming for the sake of argument, kind of, right? We call this H0, or uh, uh, the null hypothesis, H sub 0, H0. Um, and this is the one that, that we'll live with, right? It's kind of the status quo. We'll stick with it if we don't have evidence to the contrary. Uh, we also have an alternative hypothesis, and this is oftentimes um, the more exciting one. Alternative hypothesis. This is the one we will, one we will prove true. If H zero is rejected, because we're gonna, so the one way to think about this is that we're going to assume that the null is true, right? We're going to assume H zero is true, um, which means we can never prove it true. You can't prove something true if you're assuming it's true. So if you're trying to prove something true, that should always be your alternative. That's one way to look at this. So if you want to prove something true, right? Like you want to prove that uh, I don't know your your food tastes better than your com your competitor, or that uh, your your employees um, do a better job of meeting their customers' needs, um, or yeah, I don't know any of those things. Like you're more precise. Your grades are better than your brothers. Um, all that stuff goes into your alternative hypothesis, right? Uh, the null is often the most common null is there's no effect, nothing happens. Um, so the null is the one that gets the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's also, it, since it's very common that the null is, uh, there is no effect. So if you have a treatment of some kind, then no effect is the null. And you're trying to prove that there is some effect, because that's the alternative, there is some effect. Um, that's often the way that these work, right? Okay, now... The type of hypothesis, you, you, the way you frame your hypotheses means that will have implications for the type of test that you generate. Okay, there are two types of tests, really, I guess. I mean, two basic types. Uh, one is one-tailed tests. And one-tailed tests look like this. The hypotheses for one-tailed tests look like this. You're going to have, what, H0... Is mu greater than or equal to mu zero? Uh, H a mu less than mu zero. All right, this is a left-tailed test. You might also have a right-tailed test, which looks like this. Uh, let me switch colors here. H zero mu less than or equal to mu zero. H a mu greater than mu zero. This is a right-tailed test. All right. Now, why is this a left-tailed test and a right-tailed test? Well, what this is essentially saying is that the true population mean, under the null, we're assuming that the true population mean is greater than or equal to some value. Mu zero is always some value. 
And so we're assuming that the true population mean is greater than some value. Now, if it turns out that uh, that we get a really low value, so we get a really low value in our sample, then we'll know that that can't be true, right? If you think back to confidence intervals, what we're saying, what we're essentially saying here, is related to that. that if we got a really low value in our sample, there's no way that the population mean is large, right? Because we our sample mean is really small. So if we get a really low value of x bar, for example, then there's no way the mean is really high. So we would that if there's a result that's all the way in the left tail, right? Then we will reject h zero if if our result is in the left tail. By the same token, in a right tailed test, if we get a value that's really high, right? So our if our distribution under the null looks like this, and we get an x bar that's all the way over here then once we cross a certain line we're going to reject it because come on if our x bar is this high there's just no way that mu zero would be all the way over here that's just ridiculous and so if if this is a right tail test because if we got a value that was all the way in the right tail then that would lead to the rejection of the null and these are called one tail tests because we're only testing how much area how much space there is in one tail um, so our assumption is that either uh, the mean is really large, or the mean is really small, and we're testing to see if that's true or not. If it turns out that the mean is really small when we assumed it is really large, then uh, it's then we only need to know that the mass that's in one tail that will lead us to reject that assumption. So those are one-tail tests. We also have a two-tail test, and two-tail test looks like this. Two-tail test we usually use when something has to be precisely measured or when we're testing whether somebody ha is accurate in a specific claim. So mu equals mu zero versus the alternative that mu does not equal mu zero. Now a lot of times somebody will say well the uh, blah 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 the mean is equal to 12 percent right or, whatever, point, or point 0.05 or something right that's where the mean is um, and what we do is we give them the benefit of the doubt we say okay well let's assume you're right and we'll draw a sample and see if uh, if it's reasonable that we might get a sample mean like the one that you you under the distribution that you're positing is true. Um, we give them the benefit of the doubt, um, but if x bar falls too far on either side, right? If they if we get a really high x bar up here, then we'll know there's no way that that's the true mean. Or if we get a really low x bar, we'll know there's no way that that's really the true mean. It's not mu zero. And that means if x bar is in either tail, far enough in either direction, we'd reject the null. That's the difference between a, a, a one tail test and a two tail test. Ultimately, it's about where where the region of rejection is, where what kind of a value from a sample would would seem crazy to us. Okay, so worth keeping in mind is just that <clears throat> your hypotheses depend on your point of view. The null gets the benefit of the doubt, so you don't want to assume the thing you're going to prove. Um, you want to assume the thing that you're. It's the opposite of what you're going to try to prove. Uh, you know what? What might some examples of this be? Well, um, if there's a research hypothesis, uh, usually a research hypothesis is going to be the sort of thing where that shows up in your alternative, right? If you want to prove that there's some effect of something, then your research uh, is going to show up. Your research hypothesis is going to show up in, a, in your alternative hypothesis. Um, what everybody believes, oftentimes you'll put that in the null if you want to try to prove prove them wrong. You want to try to prove society wrong or something, right? That often will show up. Uh, the society's belief, the status quo belief, will show up in the null. So you give it the benefit of the doubt. That means you have a really strict test if you manage to prove it wrong. Let's see. I have some uh, some step one answers here um, <clears throat> that I looked at already. So I'll, I'll post these, but I just want to um, look at them with you guys now for step one. So if a weight loss company maintains that its program helps per people lose an average of at least 25 pounds in six months, um, that's the only part we really need to know for for part one. We're going to test their claim. Um, what that means, if they're saying that people lose an average of at least 25 pounds in six months and we want to test their claim, what that means is that we're going to choose a null that gives them the benefit of the doubt. We want to prove them wrong um, only, only if they're really off, right? We don't want to prove them wrong just because they were slightly off. So what that means is that for that example, 
where they say people lose at least 25 pounds in six months. That means our null hypothesis is going to be... Oh, where's the... Our null hypothesis is going to be that mu x is greater than or equal to 20, one, uh, 25 pounds. And our alternative is going to be that their claim is false, that people actually lose less than 25 pounds, right? And that's what that would look like. We're trying to test that company's claim. Mu x is greater than or equal to 25 pounds. Uh, we're going to let x equal pounds lost. And this is saying that we're going to assume that the average is at least 25 pounds, right? And then we're going to get a sample. And we're going to see, right, we're going to get a sample x bar. We're going to see how likely is it that we would get that result given their claim. And that's ultimately what step, step one of this process is. We need to be careful about setting up our hypotheses so that we can frame the question in a way that is useful um, so that we're not, so that we're not, either building an argument against somebody that's not a good argument and so that we're not uh, trying to prove something that we're assuming. Okay, so that's step one. I'm going to go through pretty carefully through these steps, so I'll do step uh, two and three next probably um, because they deserve a little bit of talking, but two's, two's pretty short. Um, and then we'll work our way through all of these and then we'll do some practice problems.